Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Women at Arden for today's webinar on creating and fostering inclusive teams, which is also produced and co-sponsored with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council at Arden. I'm Becky Hurley. I'm Arden's Chief Development Council, and I'm also a member of the Women at Arden uh, Steering Committee. I'd like to begin today by, with a few housekeeping uh, comments that many of you will be familiar with. First of all, your lines are currently muted, but that doesn't mean we don't want you to engage with one another and with our speaker, Stacy Malone. So please use the chat feature for that. We have allowed for time for questions and answers at the end of the program, and we'll gather your questions from the chat. Also, if this is your first time to attend a Women at Arden seminar, we welcome you and hope to see you back here in the future. And finally, although I would not ordinarily say this, you might want to have your phone nearby. There are several QR codes on the slides that will be on your screen, and you may want your phone to be able to access those. So let's begin by uh, reviewing the Women at Arden purpose today more than ever. I'm really mindful of the, the deeper meaning here as we support one another within the organization. The purpose of Women at Arden is to network with and learn practical solutions from Arden's own women leaders, sharing industry knowledge and leadership experience with the goal of supporting all women in our organization to overcome gender barriers and prepare ourselves for leadership opportunities. Now, consistent with that purpose, we have asked you from time to time to share with us what programming you would find meaningful to you. And one of the things that we've heard over and over is that an organized formal mentoring program here at Arden would be, would be very popular and very welcome. So I'm very happy to tell you today that we heard you and we will soon be launching Elevate and Engage, the Women at Arden Mentoring Program, designed to help us support one another through mentorship and elevate others throughout our organization. Uh, I want to tell you that I've been privileged to be on both sides of the mentor-mentee relationship and have found it very valuable to me personally and professionally throughout my career. Uh, I not only have lifelong friends, but I've had lots, I've had a shoulder to cry on. I've received a lot of career advice, help navigating a new role or a new job. And it's a wonderful experience on both sides of the equation. I'm also excited to tell you that our program will be powered by a platform called Kronos, and it will be used to match up mentors and mentees based on the specific leadership qualities and skills that the mentee wishes to develop. And it is a very user-friendly platform that I've used in another setting. I think you'll all find it to be an incredible resource for us. So please scan the QR code on your screen and we'll put it up again later in case you miss it right now. If you have any interest to learn more, we will be in now, we're finalizing the framework now and there'll be many more details as we move forward. Now let's connect to our larger purpose by honoring Lauren Skaggs, a wound care nurse at Hillcrest Hospital Henrietta, who exemplifies our purpose of caring for people. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Lauren and her own words. Lauren often meets patients during a time that's one of the hardest in their lives. And she says, when a patient comes to us, they're broken, frustrated, most times defeated. It's my job and my calling to not only help heal these patients' physical wounds, but also to guide them emotionally and physically to help them overcome the obstacles that may have brought them there in the first place. Wound care is a challenging field, and I'm proud to be a wound care nurse. And Lauren, we're proud of you and your positive attitude, your good sense of humor, and your ability to overcome adversity. Thank you so much for your dedication to our purpose. Now it's time for me to stop talking and turn this over to our vibrant speaker, Stacy Malone, who's Vice President of Internal Audit at Ardent in the Nashville office, to talk to us about her experience creating and fostering inclusive teams. And she's going to not only discuss that team building, but also touch on the topics of unconscious bias and allyship, uh, which I think all of us will benefit from. And Stacy, I'm pleased to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Becky. I appreciate that introduction. 
Uh, good morning or afternoon to everybody, depending on where you are. I am just so excited to be with you today to talk about such an important topic. Uh, I want to really start by saying that I don't claim to be an expert uh, in regards to inclusion, but it is a topic that I'm really passionate about. And so I really want to share with you what I've learned, uh, both from research and education, but also from trial and error um, with my own team uh, throughout my career. So we'll really get started by making sure we level set as a group and talk about what is inclusion, right? I don't want us to you know, end up five, ten minutes into this presentation and us having different thoughts on, on what it truly means. So um, throughout my presentation, um, I'm going to do my best not to just read the slides to you, but to have the information up there and kind of add to what's there. But if I were to summarize what's listed here, right, for me, when I think about what is inclusivity, to me, it's, it's fostering an environment where people feel like they can come, um, be their authentic selves, bring their diverse opinions, viewpoints, um, and that we as team members and leaders are going to leverage that, right, for the good of our team, for the good of our individual team members, but also for the good of the company so that we create a place, um, an ardent company-wide standpoint of a place where people feel like they belong, where they feel motivated and engaged. And I wanted to share um, a general quote. I've seen this a lot of late on a variety of platforms, and that quote says that diversity is what invites people to the table, um, but it's inclusion that really empowers them and their voices to actually be heard. Right, and so I want us to make sure we're, we're really focusing on hearing the voices and perspectives of everyone and increasing that engagement. And so before we move into the further into the presentation, I actually wanted to pause and ask you all a question. So for all of you that are um, joining us today, um, we're going to use the uh, Slido polling app that's part of WebEx that you'll be able to find in your right-hand corner of your screen um, to ask you all a question, um, which is really just when you think about uh, inclusion and inclusivity, what do you think the benefits are, right? Let's, let's begin with the end in mind um, and think about what does inclusion mean to each one of us. So I'll give you each a second to, to think about that and type in your responses um, that will ultimately kind of show in, in a word cloud. But what, what does inclusion mean to you? What do you think the goals really are is, is the question, right? Here are some general definitions, but based on your knowledge, your experience, any research that you've done, what do you think the goals are? What are the benefits? And again, we're just asking from your perspective, right? There's, there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to the benefits, but I am very curious to make sure, again, that you all are included in this presentation and that you get a chance to share your perspective of what you think the benefits are. definitely see some responses coming in. Ultimately, if you feel like you're not able to, to get your response into the slide, you can't always type it into the chat as well. We just want to hear your perspective, your thoughts on those benefits. All right, maybe another 30 seconds, and then we'll start looking at some of those results. Well, thank you for those of you who had a chance to participate and for any of that different. Again, if you did not, again, go ahead and type those into the chat. But I'm seeing some really great responses. And again, you can kind of see those in the right. Um, we've heard some responses like getting those diverse perspectives, um, having a sense of belonging, um, creating a sense of team and unity. Um, I saw a few chat responses about um, getting ideas and involvement from all team members. So I would say all of those are 100% correct. Um, I appreciate you sharing those views and your thoughts. Um, I'm going to tell you a 
my general thoughts, right? Not an expert, but when I think about, you know, what I consider the goals, and again, beginning with that end in mind, right? Before I tell you about how we create foster inclusivity, let me make sure we talk about what might be the benefit. Um, you know, to me, again, it's about having that sense of belonging um, for, for our teams, for artists, for making this a place where people want to be and where they thrive, um, making sure that we can bring those fresh, fresh perspectives and make decisions, but really, also, as we think about this last bullet here, how do we have an impact on results? I feel like seeking and creating that diverse and inclusive environment really kind of has some really key impact that I think there's been a variety of research that's been conducted to really prove out what they are. And so I'm going to speak to a little bit of that research, right? Um, that research has shown that when you have inclusive environments, uh, people are six times more likely to come up with innovative ideas and be more readily available and able to anticipate and adapt to change. I mean, again, I, I can see that, right? You're able to really share the ideas and thoughts and um, not just kind of go with one perspective. Research shows that um, inclusion fosters two times better likelihood of meeting financial goals, right? In, in um, in business, that's always a good thing, right? And I think um, it's always good to keep in mind that we're not just saying inclusion for inclusion's sake. It is a very important goal, but also recognizing that it has proven benefits um, from a, not only a team perspective, but a financial perspective. And even this last one, especially in kind of our current environment, um, that from a loyalty or employee retention standpoint, inclusion um, research has shown helps um, kind of keep employees in your environment for at least one year, right? They're 42% more likely um, to stay in your organization for at least a year versus leaving. So I think all of those are powerful reasons um, and goals of inclusion, um, along with all the great um, ideas that you all shared in the chat. So as we really kind of get started into um, how do we achieve those goals, um, I wanted to really kind of kick off the formal presentation part to talk about those four tips that can help us kind of boost that inclusivity. So those are listed here um, on the slide. I'll let you read through those. We're going to cover each of them in more detail. Um, but one thing I wanted to say before we get uh, into each of these topics is that we can all have an impact on creating and fostering inclusivity. Um, it's not a matter of are you or are you not a leader or individual contributor, we all have a role to play, right? You can be that team member that people go to, that people feel comfortable with. You can be the person that amplifies other people's ideas. You can be the person that stands up um, if you hear or see bias or disrespect. And so just remembering that we all have a role to play, and that role may or may not change depending on where we are in our career, but no matter where we are, we do have a role to play. So. With that, we'll get started talking about the first tip, which is, you know, fairly simple, right? Treat others with fairness. Um, again, I'll let you all read through these topics, but, you know, I'll speak to what they really mean to me, why it resonates so much. Um, I think that when we hear this kind of topic of actively listening and hearing ideas, it sounds obvious, right? Why wouldn't we all do that? Um, but I think that we have to remember that um, sometimes it's hard to remember to react objectively um, to things or ideas or perspectives that we disagree with, right? And especially if you think about a team environment, we want to make sure that we're encouraging people to share their ideas, even if ultimately that's not what we go with. But hearing those ideas, hearing those different perspectives is really what fosters and creates that environment um, of inclusion. And so I would say kind of remembering for each of us to think about, are we inadvertently um, discouraging other people from sharing their ideas? Are we not listening when they're speaking? Are we immediately criticizing versus pausing and really hearing what they have to say and evaluating it? Um, a really powerful uh, topic for me is this, this second bullet, which is feedback. Um, for me, that's one of the most important things um, in our daily lives, but especially from a work perspective. And you'll notice that it's not just getting or, or receiving feedback. For me, it's one, it's a loop. And it really relates to also us making sure that we are then following through and responding to the feedback. So making sure that we're open and willing um, to ask for feedback, to give feedback to others, even if it's a tough conversation. I'll make a quick plug that there was a really great uh, Women at Art presentation uh, previously about having those tough conversations. But 
being willing to do that, but then ultimately responding to the feedback, right? It doesn't do us any good to have these great discussions and get feedback if we don't then react and respond where it's appropriate. Um, I'll talk a little bit about amplifying good ideas. Um, I'm going to take a guess here and say that most of us that are um, in this uh, WebEx today have been in a meeting in a situation where we have shared what we thought was a great idea and either it was maybe completely ignored or silence when you said it and then five minutes, 20 minutes later, somebody else um, says the same thing and everybody you know, jumps on it and it gains traction and you're thinking, I just said that. Um, and so I think we've all had that experience, but what I would encourage each of us to do is think about how we combat that. How can we kind of be a change agent um, to make sure we're not doing that to others and or that we help um, others get their ideas heard. And so what I would encourage everybody to do is, one, um, think about the fact that we don't want just the most powerful or the loudest voices to be heard, right? Um, that's one way to do things. Um, and again, that's part of where you miss the opportunity to be more adaptable, to have those better ideas. What we really want, and the goal of inclusion, is to have the best ideas to be heard and for proper credit to be given for those ideas. Um, one of my simple approaches, so that people know that I heard them and understood, is, and people that are around me hear me say it all the time, I say, to your point, because I want them to know I, I heard you. Um, I'm not just parroting what you said or paraphrasing it to make it sound like I thought of it, but I heard what you said, and what you said was meaningful and powerful. Um, or I may be in a meeting with someone else and say, you know, give that person credit. I was just speaking with a so-and-so yesterday, and they made this right point, or they said this. Um, and then to the extent possible, right, either seeking to be included in, in meetings that relate to either projects you're working on or ideas that you have, or if you're in a position of leadership, seeking to exclude others, right? Um, again, increasing that inclusion and awareness and giving people that opportunity, kind of that last bullet of providing that access uh, for growth and development. Um, you know, one thing that I would say, too, is as we think about that growth, development, advancement, we want to make sure that, again, we are giving people the opportunity, but not necessarily um, determining their path for them, right? Remember that we all have a voice. That voice needs to be heard. We want to give equal, earned opportunities to everyone, but that it's not about each of us, you know, enforcing what we want on others. It's about helping them become who they can and want to be. Um, and so I would just encourage each of us to think about that in our day-to-day -day life. And um, I'm going to kind of lead into what is a, a really great quote that I heard. Um, I've heard it a few times, and I've seen it in a few presentations. Um, it's a quote from Stephen Covey um, that I think is going to be really powerful as we think about um, the second bullet, which is that we think we see the world as it is, when in fact we see the world as we are. I'm going to let you guys you know, read that one more time and, and really think about it. Um, and as you think about it, I want to kind of, again, speak to what that means when I hear that, how that resonates with me. When I hear that, um, I think it reminds me that, one, so much of who we are, our behavior, our decisions, our responses, they're influenced by our, our experiences. How can they not be? Um, by our experiences, their input, they're in, in, in influenced by um, what inputs we have, be that um, social media, news media, friends, family, um, and society as a whole, right? And so I think that we have to recognize that and consider how is it possible to diversify all those inputs that we're receiving, um, really thinking about do we have any biases, biases or other things that are impacting our, our judgment, our decision making, and then really trying to make sure that we're focused on how do we address that. And so that's, again, a powerful quote that really leads into um, our point two, which is for each of us, as we try to be more inclusive, as we really try to um, build teams that are inclusive, that we really think about um, educating ourselves, right? Seek understanding and examine our own biases. Again, sounds simple, and, and in some ways it is, but um, I would say it's also very tough, right? Each of these points that we're going through um, on the surface are, you know, feel like no-brainers, they feel obvious, but they each take work. Um, you know, for this one, I would say that you'll notice kind of a, a recurring theme as, as I talk which is that it's not just about understanding, it's about then acting. You know, so I, I mentioned the quote earlier about you know, 
diversity giving us a seat at the table and inclusion allowing our voices to be heard and that um, from a feedback perspective of treating others fairly that we want to get and receive feedback but then we have to actually act upon it. The same thing is true here that we don't need to just understand our biases. That is very important, a key part of this, but then we have to act on them, right? Once you're aware of them, it does no good if you don't then follow through and make change and adjustment. And so for me, the first T is really trying to educate ourselves. And there are a wide variety of ways to do that. Um, one really good one that is really readily available to all of us um, is that we have the One Team Resource Center, which if you go on the artist internet, it is at the bottom uh, in the kind of the boxes. Uh, on the One Team Resource Center, there is a whole host of diversity and inclusion related materials um, that you can really look into. You know, one of those is going to be an um, a survey about you know how inclusive are you an assessment that you can take that um, I think the link is being shared in the chat um, but there are a whole host of um, presentations of surveys of links to materials of training courses that can really be helpful as you think about educating yourself here's what I would say right is that we all naturally have our preferences and our dislikes whether that be our sports teams, our food, policies, you name it, right? We, we've got preferences and dislikes. But similarly, we all have biases, whether that is an affinity based on people's gender, age, personality, race, appearance, we have them. Um, and so just making sure that we're aware of those and aware of the fact that our brain naturally, again, takes shortcuts, right, based on our experiences to make a decision, to reach a judgment. Um, what that also means is that hey, while well, that might help us be more efficient, it might also mean that our biases are having an impact in our day-to-day -day life, including our work life. And so a couple of tips as you think about trying to educate yourself, right? Um, one is, you know, again, trying to become aware of your biases. There are a variety of ways to do that, one of which is that self-assessment. Um, we're going to share resources. There's um, an implicit association test that Harvard has out there with a variety of topics. Um, there are obviously a whole host of, of books and, and things that you can look into, but you can also seek help from others, whether it be someone that you trust that you could say, I've identified that I do X, Y, or Z. Um, can you help me by being mindful and watchful and kind of pointing out if you see me um, doing one of those things that, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to move away from. Um, you can, in a work setting, right, if you're worried about, the, the judgments that you're making are just trying to be more inclusive. You know, think about asking people that you don't normally seek their opinion, right? Someone that's in a different department um, that you don't normally talk to or, you know, someone on your team um, that you haven't interacted with as much to seek their opinion on things, right? Getting those more diverse viewpoints um, into your judgment, into your decision-making process. Um, I would say that as you do this, as you try to educate yourself on your biases, it's natural, right? We all do it. We all have that instinctive reaction to protect ourselves, right? To defend ourselves, to rationalize our behavior, whether it's from reading a book and a topic really hits home and or seeing something and immediately wanting to negate it. I would say for me, one of the hardest parts about this, this specific tip is that we really have to try to be open-minded and really kind of get to the root of what we're hearing, what we're seeing, and let it take hold and let change come about. Uh, the last bullet I have on the slide talks about listening to the stories of bias from others to help you raise your awareness. I think this is powerful, but also I have a couple of, of key points on this one, right? I think you have to really do that one in the right way. Um, I think that number one, you've really got to make sure you've taken the time to educate yourself, right? That you're not asking others to educate you instead of you trying to educate yourself. Um, you don't want to put somebody on the spot and say, tell me about your story, tell me about um, things that are, you know, potentially deeply personal to you, um, especially if you don't have a relationship with that person. So I think having that relationship is important, educating yourself is important, but also considering, you know, has that person indicated that they are open um, to sharing their experiences, um, but also knowing that, again, you're asking them from an authentic place um, that you're truly open and willing and want to learn. Um, you know, we don't want this to be something where you're asking just to, you know, argue or to debate or to prove your point, really that you're open to hearing that perspective, even if ultimately you don't agree, but just being open to hear that 
Um, you know, and also being okay if they're not willing to share, remembering that nobody is required to share their experience with you. Um, and then the last two things I would say is, you know, recognize that even as you maybe seek those opinions from those that you're close to, that um, no one person is the authority, right? As I talked about before, I'm, I'm talking about this topic that I'm passionate about, but no one person is an authority or speaks for an entire group of people. Um, and that as you think about taking this approach, that you're kind of going into it to ask thoughtful questions, really kind of listen carefully and empathize with what they're going to share that, again, may have kind of a deep or painful impact on their lives. Um, we're kind of down to like the last two topics. Um, the third tip that I would share is trying to build teams with diversity in mind. Um, and this is kind of from all aspects, whether that is as you hire, um, as you assign projects, or um, take on different roles within your team, or as you think about promotions for people and giving new opportunities. Um, you know, I think that we got to really be mindful of, again, thinking objectively, so that if we are doing any of those things, hiring, promoting, giving out assignments, that we're really thinking about what are the objective criteria needed? Um, does, it, does it align with the candidate or the team member skill set? Is this a a, a, t a time where we're trying to give them a growth opportunity and making sure we're communicating our thoughts, getting their buy-in, um, that we also make sure that we are thinking about those development opportunities, right? I mean, the only way that we grow um, is through trying new things, potentially failing at those things, um, but giving ourselves that opportunity to try something new. Um, I would say that from a hiring perspective or a promotion perspective, one of the things I like to do is kind of involve several people in that process right, get that different perspective, get those hers um, so that it's not just you, because we all have that tendency to hire people, promote people that are like us, that we feel a connection to in some way, right, and if this isn't to say that there's something wrong with that, but we just got to make sure that we are doing that from an objective standpoint of what the job requires, so that we're promoting, we're hiring the best candidates to bring those diverse perspectives to foster that environment of inclusion. Um, and then I would say also something that works well for me from an interview perspective, and again, this works for me, it may not work for you, is that I typically have two stages of an interview. They happen fairly quickly together, but my first stage is typically a phone interview with no video. Uh, for me, it just kind of eliminates that any other bias, right, in terms of what you look like, what the room looks like, how you're dressed, any of those appearance or other biases that might come into play. Instead, I'm solely focused on your resume, your qualifications, do they meet the job, and how is our general interaction? And then if that goes well, then I'll quickly have that person come in for an in-person interview. Um, I find that works well for me. Again, it may not work well for you, but for me it's a great tip to, again, kind of eliminate any biases that I might um, tend towards. Um, we'll also talk about kind of this, this last tip that I have, which is responding to bias and disrespect, right? Um, Equally important as all the other topics is the fact that if we do see or hear bias and disrespect, we have to speak up, right? If we're silent to it, that clearly tells our team members that we're not serious about, you know, having that inclusive environment. They feel like, okay, no, no one would speak up for me or my team member, my boss witnessed this. They didn't say anything. Um, and so I think we have to be mindful of being consistent in how we respond. Um, and think, and being um, and thinking about having an appropriate response, right? This isn't about publicly calling people out because um, that's probably just going to make them feel defensive or feel ostracized and not going to be inspired to change. Um, you know, so it's better to you know maybe ask for clarification or to kind of reconsider their comments or even you know think about talking to them you know, separately aside from the whole group if it happened in a group setting. Uh, but I would also encourage you to, you know, one, don't excuse that behavior, right? I think we all have a tendency to, well, they probably didn't mean it that way, but here's the thing, they very well might, might not have, and in many cases they might not, but are they going to say that again? Are they going to repeat that? Have we helped them learn and grow and also create that inclusive environment? And so I think the third bullet here is really important, right? Developing potential responses, right? Because what so often happens is that situation comes up where somebody says something it just doesn't sit well with you, right? They say anecdotally some stereotype that they've heard. Um, they use a term or a phrase that really bothers you where you can see impacts on another team member. What we have to do is kind of have those responses ready so that we're not caught off guard um, when they happen. So some typical responses that I kind of have handy is to say, mm, I'm not sure I 
understood what you mean by X, Y, or Z, right? They just give them a chance to clarify what they meant, right? And I would say most of the time what they meant and what they said might differ. Um, you know, thinking about something like, hey, I know you didn't mean it this way, but somebody might find your statement X, Y, Z. They might find it offensive um, saying that, hey, I realize that some people might be okay with you using this term, but I just want to let you know that I'm not comfortable with it, right? Trying to, to share um, what it is about what they said that just doesn't sit well with you. Um, but I say this too, I recognize that um, all that sounds good, and I think that, that those are great tactics to use when it's somebody that you know or you feel comfortable having that conversation with, but we don't always feel that, right? Sometimes we are worried that we either don't have the relationship to, to make that statement, or we feel like that's our boss, or that there could be a, a chance for retaliation. So I say there are other ways to make sure that we respond to bias and disrespect. Um, one of those is um, involving um, either HR or using the uh, compliance hotline, which can be anonymous, to kind of put in a tip to say, I observed this, this is really concerning to me, let me give you that information without maybe having to share, you know, who it is that's saying that. But another way is the last bullet here, which is really participating in and using um, engagement surveys, right? It's an easy, anonymous way to get to share your opinion. Um, and it's, again, as you think about those surveys, if we're all voicing our opinion, right, especially thinking that there's going to be differences, it becomes harder for leadership, team members, all of us to ignore something if multiple people are saying it, right? And so I think that survey is a great way um, for you to be able to really kind of share that information um, with the team. And so I would just encourage each of you, if you haven't already done so, um, to take the upcoming uh, engagement survey. We're actually going to put up a, a link to that uh, survey so you can scan the QR code if you haven't done it yet. I would definitely encourage you to do so. Um, again, they're important. I know sometimes I feel like I get, I get too many surveys or is my voice being heard. Here's one thing I do know. If you don't speak, it definitely can't be heard. Um, so I encourage each of you to take that. While you're using that QR code, um, hopefully to, to take the survey or opening the, the link uh, from the chat to at least have it ready so you can take it as soon as we're, we're off this call. Um, I want to ask you guys one more question, right? You've now heard each of the four tips, right? So we talked about treating others fairly. We talked about seeking understanding and examining your bias. We talked about building teams with diversity in mind and responding to bias and disrespect. You know, now that you've heard those, I really want to kind of start that self-awareness right now. And I'm going to um, have you guys answer this poll. Again, it's going to be um, using the, the Slido in the bottom right corner, but as you think about those four topics that are listed in the Slido, which do you think you have the most room for improvement or growth, right? Really kind of evaluate where you think you are um, and what do you think is, is where you have that most room for opportunity. Um, I'm just very curious, again, what your perspectives are um, based on what, what you've heard today and what you know about yourself. As you all take that um, survey, we'll, we'll keep moving moving ahead and then we'll, we'll talk about the results. Um, but I just, again, I think it's important that as we think about um, each of those four tips that we can start with ourselves, right? Start with trying to be very self-aware of how we can impact inclusion, how we can be that team member that helps create and foster that in our day-to-day -day lives, in our work lives, um, so that art it just is the place people feel like they belong. I'll give everybody 10, 15 more seconds um, to really think about and respond to um, which of those areas you feel like you have the most room for improvement or growth. All right, let's, let's take a look at um, how you all responded. Uh, I'm just very curious, right? I think it's, it's a thing that's going to differ um, for each of us as we think about where we have that room for growth or, or opportunity. Um, but again, I think it's important that we each evaluate it in turn so we know where to go from here. Like I said, 
fair number of you have responded so far. As we wait for the poll to close, I'll kind of briefly talk about what's left. We're going to talk about, you know, next steps now that we've gone through these four tips. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of questions that you might have. So definitely be thinking about any questions that you have related to this topic. I'll definitely do my best to answer those. Um, and so as we, as we think about the next step, right, I think, again, that's what, part of what's important in all of this is that, again, it's important to raise the awareness, but it's also important to then, what do I do with it? Um, so we've, we've shared those couple of links of a few ways to really assess your, your biases. Um, to really think about um, what resources are available. So I would, again, encourage people to go out to the One Team Resource Center, look at all the great uh, information and resources that are out there. Take a few of those Harvard uh, Implicit Association tests, right? The goal of those tests is kind of really educate each of us about our biases um, and provide a way to kind of collect that data collectively from the internet. But I would say there's a variety of topics. Right, whether that be religion, orientation, weight, skin tone, disability, and a whole host of others, where you can really try to objectively um, assess you know, where you are. Um, take that how inclusive are you self evaluation. Again, one thing that it requires you to do is, again, try to really be self aware, uh, evaluate yourself honestly and objectively, um, to then be able to then move forward and think about where you have room for growth or improvement. Um, and then try to take those next steps. Right? Be the voice you know, in your team that amplifies others. Be the person in your team that is trying to hear those diverse perspectives, that is looking to educate yourself um, and educate others, right? Share the information as you learn it. Um, you know, be that person that works to build the team that um, people want to be a part of, where they feel like they belong. Um, and then I also wanted to make sure I gave kind of one final plug um, to what Becky mentioned earlier, right? Arnett is starting the Elevate and Engage Mentoring Program, which is such a powerful opportunity. So I would encourage everybody that if you have any inkling, any desire to learn, to grow, to develop, consider being a part of it, whether that be as a mentor or as a mentee. We're looking for both, right? Both have key roles to play. Um, so really consider um, joining this. I know it's top of mind for um, me to join um, because I, I think it's so powerful to have mentors, um, to have sponsors, to have those that can kind of help pave the way. So whether you are the person that has that experience and knowledge to share or you're looking to gain it, um, I would say scan this QR code, um, consider joining. And I did see um, our survey results pop up, but it sounds like, you know, examining that bias and seeking understanding. Um, no surprise there, honestly, is kind of the top thing that people are, are looking to make strides and improvement in. So thank you all for answering that polling question. Stacy, are you ready to take some questions? I am. And I do want to thank you so much for your perspectives and for your advice. I appreciate the practical suggestions that you made on some of these issues and I'm going to circle back to those. But first, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, this program is being co-sponsored by Arden's Diversity, Inclusion and Equity Council. And I wondered as a member of that council, if you would like to share with us now what you or the council is working on to address these inclusivity issues. Absolutely. Um, so the Arden uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council um, it's still, you know, fairly new, uh, but what we're really focused on is, is a few key areas, right? Um, you know, we really started with trying to better understand, one, what is artist rep representation, um, kind of really by geographic area, right? Because it matters to understand where we are as we think about where we're going. And so we're continually updating and evaluating that, sharing that with leadership to make sure they're cognizant of where we are and how do we move forward. Um, we really try to make sure that even from like an engagement survey perspective, another plug to make sure everybody does that, is that we yeah. try to have in, in, in input into some of the questions that get put on there, right? I know some of the questions this time relate to belonging, right? We want to hear what people need, why they do or don't feel like they belong in artists. Um, you know, we work with HR to communicate really where do we see artists moving forward in the next three years 
And part of that ability to make the growth we're looking to do is hiring a resource that is focused on that. And HR is all on board for that. They have created a position that they're looking to fill that will be the person that kind of heads up um, diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives here at ARDA. Because we can always make strides. We each have a role to play. But a key part of that is that it's also somebody's specific job in addition to each of us making efforts and strides. Um, and then lastly, I would say that really focusing on raising awareness, right? We've evaluated multiple different vendors' training options, and not just training of go sit in a classroom or do online materials, but really getting the resources out there, raising awareness of DEI topics, um, making sure, again, that when we talk about it, people understand why it's important um, raising their awareness. Those are just a few of the things that are, are top of mind for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. Well, you have been very busy for a council that, that was <laughs> formed so recently. I appreciate that. I want to go back to uh, the slide numbered four because I noticed on our last uh, survey question that we had a, a strong plurality of the respondents saying that they felt that res knowing how to respond to instances of bias was what it, the area in which they needed the most improvement. And you did give some great practical tips, but I'd like just to circle back and say, do you have different advice for us uh, in, in two areas. One, if you witness the bias kind of privately versus in a group setting. And the other is, what if the person demonstrating the bias is above you in the organization or on the org chart, it's a manager or supervisor, and there's that kind of status issue? Do you have particular thoughts around those two uh, variations on the theme, if you will? Absolutely. Um, so I would say from the private or, or public standpoint, I would say number one, it's sometimes it's a little bit easier if it's in private. Um, there's a, a less likelihood of a large group hearing it and you're more easily able to address that potentially one-on-one -on -one with that person at the time. Yeah. Um, here's how I always tell people though, is really be mindful of your mindset when you try to you know, have that and respond to bias, right? If, if you are in that moment, angry, upset, frustrated, it might not be the time um, to talk about it, right? You Maybe you should, you know, take a day or two, calm down. You know, it's important to try to bring that up in close proximity to the um, kind of observed event happening, but you want to do that from a place of calm because obviously if you're angry or frustrated, the conversation isn't likely to go well. Um, I would say from a group perspective, again, I would definitely try to make sure that you want to potentially, you know, if you can, um, ask them to clarify so that you know, they can hopefully restate what they really meant. Um, but if, if that's not an option, then again, trying to talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And then to the second part of your question, yes, I do think it makes a difference, right? I think we're all aware that um, it can be um, our, our leaders, a person that we report to. It could be that it's our leader and a person that they're close to that could both impact our job. And so that's where I do feel like it's important to consider your local HR representative, consider that anonymous hotline as other alternatives to actually going to the person because that does create added complexity. Thank you. I appreciate that advice because I think those those special circumstances do kind of warrant particular care and concern. And that's about that's all the questions we're going to have time for today. But I want to thank you again so much for your uh, guidance and your mentoring. You mentored us all as a group here today. Thanks again for being with us. Now, as we wrap up here, I have a few last slides I want to cover. First, uh, you'll see on the screen another QR code. We were full of them today uh, to get your feedback on this session. That's really important to us. In pl we, we plan the whole year in advance and are always looking for ideas and we need your feedback. So please let us know what you thought about today's program and we will take that into account in putting our calendar together moving forward. Then uh, we have one more slide that is like the trailer for next month's uh, episode. This is a very exciting webinar on our calendar for July. We're gonna feature a different format on a different day of the week a fireside chat on Tuesday, July 19th between our Chief Marketing Officer, Tyra Palmer, and Ellen Havdala, a member of Arden's Board of Directors, a woman with 
a fascinating background uh, that I have no doubt you will enjoy hearing. So please make sure to register for the program on July 19th with Ellen Havdala and Tyra Palmer. And uh, one more plug for the mentor program and, and more to come on that. Thank you all again for participating today in the Women at Arden program, and we will see you July 19th. Thanks.